Well, economics really begins with uh, the concept of scarcity and choice. The, uh, we hear a lot of, a lot of material, a lot of, a lot of writings in the press uh, by uh, sociologists and belletrists and other such low types uh, and low type intellectuals that we are now living in a post-scarcity age and that maybe in the 19th century there was, a, there was such a thing as economics. 19th century there was economics and there was prices and things like that. You had to worry about things like supply and demand. <clears throat> uh, but now in the 20th century, uh, especially in 19, post-1970, we now live in a post-scarcity age. We don't have to worry about such a thing as scarcity. And now there isn't any more economics. <clears throat> well, the first, uh, the first thing that the economist, any economist is trained to think in terms of is that this is a lot of nonsense because uh, everything is scarce. If it wasn't scarce, that was a very, very good test, I think, to when something is scarce or not, when resources are scarce or not. Uh, if it wasn't scarce, then everything would be free. Uh, and not only free, but immediate, instantaneous at hand. The, uh, I, I like to call the Garden of Eden model. <coughs> uh, the Garden of Eden model is essentially that if you, as soon as you wish for something, it's right there. Uh, as soon as you wish for the bottle of Pepsi, it's trickling down your throat with no effort or investment of resources in, any, in anybody's part. Uh, and we obviously are not in that kind of situation. We never will be in that sort of situation. And uh, <clears throat> if we were in any, in any way approximating that situation, we would be, uh, uh, we would be uh, in a state where everything was more or less almost free, let's say. I mean, Cadillac would be selling at a nickel. And when we get to the stage when Cadillacs are a nickel or uh, Pepsi is trickling down your throat at your wish, then we can think about revising or scrapping economics and going on to the more utopian uh, post-scarcity future. Uh, the, uh, I use this, the, a ploy in, in debate, it's a very good debating uh, tactic, uh, against a, a post-scarcity type a couple of years ago, and I said... Uh, if you really, if we really lived in a world with post scarcity, and all you people were talking about post scarcity would be burning your salary checks because there's no point in having a salary because everything is free, etc. And the, my opponent shot back at the statement, "Well, since we live in a, you know, we, we still live in an evil uh, capitalist world where everybody's brainwashed by capitalism, and therefore he, <laughs> they haven't gotten to the point yet where they can throw off the shackle." Well, that's, I see, see some obvious. Uh, <coughs> Obviously, evading the point that everything uh, is here. Uh, <clears throat> okay, the, um, me, uh, resources are scarce. Resources consist of to uh, time, uh, material objects. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, and and all sorts of consumer capital goods. We haven't got explaining them yet. Uh, <clears throat> But what we have to do with these resources, we have to make sure that the resources are allocated to the most useful, most important ends rather than, the, rather than the poorest ends. And here we get to the difference between economics on the one hand and technology on the other. Many people don't really see the difference. Technologically, lots of things are possible or feasible. They're not feasible at all economically. For example, it might be, it might be I don't know, since I'm not really technologically uh, a technological expert, it might very well be technologically possible to build a tunnel from here to San Francisco. Uh, not only that, but a tunnel lined in platinum and, and precious jewels and so forth. It might very well be possible. It will take, of course, twenty trillion dollars or something, and, and we wouldn't be able to eat for about five years, but we could do it. And the question then is, should we do it? <coughs> uh, what are we giving up in the process of, of doing this? And uh <coughs> So uh, a tunnel might, uh, that sort of tunnel might be technologically feasible, but obviously it would be economically unfeasible. <laughs> economically unfeasible meaning that the resources, the precious, scarce land, labor, capital, which would have to be used to build this, uh, the silly tunnel, would much better be used, much more, uh, much more properly be used, producing uh, Food, TV sets, clothing, uh, automobiles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All the things that we need much more than we need the, 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 the tunnel. So the economic problem is a problem of allocating 
scarce means, scarce resources to the most important ends rather than the least important ends. And as a matter of fact, the definition of waste, which is really an economic concept rather than a technological concept, the definition of waste is, is uh, taking resource, scarce resources and applying them to the less than the most important ends. For example, building this tunnel. It might be, you know, it might be a great tunnel once it's through. It might be a feasible tunnel. The tunnel might hold up. Uh, it might not you know, collapse. But, in other words, it would be technologically uh, uh, feasible. But uh, it would be a waste of resources because almost anything else done with a two, three trillion dollars would be better than, than, uh, than wasting it on this tunnel. <laughs> so uh, it would be economically ridiculous, even though it would be technologically feasible. <laughs> Uh, all right, I like to, uh, at this point, go into what's, what's known in uh, economics as Crusoe economics. Um, Crusoe is a, uh, I, I find a very interesting figure here. First of all, students tend to get very confused at this point and say, uh, why are we worrying about Robinson Crusoe? I'm supposed to be worrying about the modern, the modern world. And I try to tell them, uh, this, at that point that I'm not really, I don't really care about Robinson Crusoe or the other. The purpose of Crusoe economics is to isolate, it's the first to take one person, one man, and pit him vis-a-vis -vis nature, so to speak, and isolate uh, one man vis-a-vis -vis nature, and then see what happens, see how we can analyze his actions, uh, and then, then bring in other people, bring in Friday and other people, etc. Because we find out we can, uh, we can grasp uh, most of the basic economic concepts just by studying the actions of Robinson Crusoe. Uh, okay, let's, let's take Crusoe on a desert island. Let's say, well, it's better if it's not a desert island. So it's a pretty bountiful island. So if it's really a desert island, it'd be in pretty bad shape. Uh, he's shipwrecked. <coughs> he starts off, uh, well, he starts off with certain, certain, uh, resources at his command. First of all, he's got his own personal energy. Uh, <coughs> commanding this personal energy, he has his own technological knowledge built up over the course of the years. He knows how to make a net. He knows how to, you know, make a bow and arrow and all that sort of stuff. Uh, how to build a log cabin and so forth. So he has technological knowledge. <coughs> he knows what he, what, you know, he certainly knows what ends he wants to pursue. In fact, he has lots of ends that he has to pursue very, very quickly or else he's going to die out, such as finding food, shelter, clothing, etc. Uh, and then he looks around for the limited resources his command. He tries to achieve, waste a little, as little as possible to achieve his, uh, his uh, most important ends with the resources he's got. Uh, <clears throat> he tries to achieve his most important values with his limited time and, and resources available. He's, uh, okay, so he's got his personal energy. What else has he, has he got? He's got nature. He's got the island, whatever that happens to be. So he starts off, starts off with personal energy uh, and nature. These are the two original resources, as they're called. Uh, energy is called, uh, and, and here, we, here we have a heritage from 18th, or late 18th century, early 19th century economics. Personal energy is called labor. Now this has caused a lot of confusion over the years because when we think of labor now, we think of labor in proletarian terms or Marxian terms as somebody who's employed by, a, you know, by an employer. This is not what labor means in any in economic language. Uh, labor means anybody who's, in, who's using personal energy in the process of, let's just say, production. In the process of production, I haven't explained what production is yet. And anyway, anybody who's, who's uh, using personal energy in the process of production would be a laborer. So on that basis, on that, uh, for example, where the president of General Motors would be a laborer in this sense. Uh, the, the stockholder, somebody who's simply clipping coupons, would not be a laborer. So anybody who's involved directly in using personal energy is using labor. And this is the original 18th century, uh, early 19th century definition. Uh, and, they, and then there's nature. Now nature is, is, has another term for it in economics, which is, again, means sort of the same thing, but not quite, which therefore leads to a lot of confusion. And that's called land. <coughs> so the reason why it's sort of the same thing, but not quite, <coughs> is that it's true there's land there, and there's, you know, there's, there's the forest and so forth and so on, but also, for example, there's a river, which has fish in it. Well, the river is called land in, in economics, in economic theory. 
Uh, in common sense English, it would not be called land, it would be called water. So, in other words, <laughs> land includes water. <clears throat> on the other hand, land in economics does not include any structure, any man-made structure built on top of it. It's the original nature-given resource. That means uh, when, <clears throat> land would include the, the space underneath this building, but not the building on top of it. That's not land. Of course, usually we, we tend to think in Again, in the common sense of English, you can tend to think of land including the buildings on top of it. <clears throat> so, uh, so here's Crusoe. He has his goals which he set out for himself. He has his values which he's trying to achieve. And he's got <clears throat> limited scarce resources, uh, land and labor, which he has to apply very quickly to this, to achieving these ends. Now the ends that he has to achieve, he ranks on a scale of values. Uh, he has to rank them because he's got to choose, you know, how does he allocate his time, for example? Does he spend the next three hours looking for, for berries or hunting fish or whatever? So, <clears throat> he's got to decide whether, uh, he decides on how to allocate his time on the basis of his value scale. And the value scale, it doesn't have to be very elaborate. As a matter of fact, it's something like, uh, the example again I use for students is, uh, you have a choice of how to spend a block of three hours tonight. <clears throat> And you have, you know, like eight choices. You actually have a lot more in New York. You can go to half a dozen movies, a party, and concert, and so forth, and that way down the list is reading your homework. You know, number 20 or something. And you make this, you make up a little chart for yourself, and you pick what you think is going to be the highest in your value scale. And you allocate your three hours to that. So, uh, <clears throat> this value scale is a very, is a, it's amazing what, what, uh, how much heavy weather is made out of a very simple concept of economics. Uh, how much, uh, how mi millions of wasted words have been spent on this topic. At any rate, <clears throat> it's, it's really a fairly simple concept, basically. Namely, that it's a, it's a strictly ordinal scale in the first place. In other words, it's, it's a, you're ranking the first movie, second movie, and third movie. You're not saying, well, I think I will prefer, you know, this movie 2.8 times more than the second movie. It's obvious nonsense. I mean, what do you mean by 2.8? Uh, you're making strictly ordinal choices. Uh, rankings, first, second, and third. Well, I prefer this first, this second, this third. Uh, <clears throat> anything else is really, you know, sort of, uh, is really meaningless. If you say, I prefer seeing this person 2.7 times more than seeing that person. You know, it's ridiculous. There's no unit that you can use for measurement. So, uh, so Crusoe or anybody else ranks his values on this value, ordinal value scale. <clears throat> and the scale can change over time. It usually does as people learn more, they satisfy one want, and another one pops up, and so forth. And, uh, and of course different people have different values and different value scales. They might have even the same values or different rankings for them. Uh, <clears throat> But the, 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 the point of this value scale is strictly ordinal, it cannot be measured, is really still being fought out in economics. It's an amazing thing. But uh, I guess people need something to do. This is part of the activity. Uh, okay, so Crusoe, Crusoe finds, he finds that nature is bigger than lay, as we say. In other words, well, he's got that personal energy, all right. He's got the stream there and the fish. There's not too much else. So he's got to work hard to do what? He's got to work hard to take these, na these natural resources, take the land, and transform it very quickly <coughs> uh, into m uses and methods uh, and patterns by which uh, he, can, he can start using, enjoying the, uh, the fruits. In other words, he has to start uh, getting, he has to construct a bow and arrow and hunt deer or something. Or he has to, uh, build a net and hunt fish, or get a log chopped down, get an axe and chop down trees and build a log cabin. So, it's only after he gets the, the fish, and after he gets the, in other words, it's the fish he wants, the fish in the cabin and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, and, and the deer and the meat that he wants. The other stuff are simply means, uh, byways, uh, paths by which he finally gets to the, to the desired, uh, direct use. Uh, the, direct, the directly useful products that he wants to he actually uses. In other words, his final goal are called consumer goods. So he eats the fish and he lives in a log cabin and he, and he uh, eats the meat and so forth. This is 
or he wears the clothing. These are direct consumer goods. Everything else, uh, everything else in this process of transformation, of getting from the original nature, natural book and so forth down to the consumer good, all these other things are called capital goods. So now we have, uh, All these other things are called capital goods. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> so now we have the category of capital goods, which are stations on the way to the consumer good. Anything else, anything which is not either personal energy or uh, land, original land, or is not directly useful, uh, which are consumer goods. All these other things are capital goods. Capital goods are, uh, <coughs> of course, very heterogeneous, obviously. They consist of all sorts of stuff. For example, in the, uh, in the case of Crusoe, there's only the axe, and there's not too many. There's the axe and the, and the, uh, and the bow and arrow. <coughs> Maybe a boat if he's finally able to construct one. In the modern world, getting back to the modern world, <coughs> uh, there's an enormous number of capital goods of, of all sorts of processes and stages of this process, this transformation process. It's only the transformation process is called production. So what we mean by production is the use of personal energy operating on land and uh, transforming land into this process of the capital goods to finally get to the consumer good. Uh, take, for example, all these stages of production that are involved in, in, in me finally, you know, me eating a ham sandwich tomorrow. Uh, there's an enormous number of stages involving millions of people, literally. <coughs> Uh, and all of, you know, scattered all over the world. The, uh, there's, uh, I, I can't even trace the little stuff going back. If you start just with a ham, you have to go, then go to the wholesaler of the ham and then the, 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 the uh, jobber and then the meat packer and then the slaughterhouse and then back to the, to the pig raiser and then back to the corn raiser who, who feeds the pig and so forth and so on. And the machinery that's used in all this process plus the land that's used in all this stuff, plus the, the uh, trucks that are used to transport them, the tires and the gasoline, all these things, you know, reduce all the way back to many, many decades and scattered over a large area. And all, all these things in the process of, of, in the process of production, whether it's the wholesale, uh, whether it's the stock, stockyards, or the trucks, or the inventory of uh, armor, ham, or whatever, all these things are capital goods. Until they finally get to the retail store or the restaurant and you buy them. Uh, and then, of course, the, if you get to the, the bread, there's the whole process going up to the flour and the miller and all that stuff and back to the wheat farmer and the threshing machine and way, way back. And when you get to the butter on the bread, you go through the whole process again. So the, the, the amount of capital goods is enormous. And each, in each stage of production, land and labor is involved in this whole process. Uh, <clears throat> okay, we have uh, <clears throat> we have Crusoe uh, allocating his resources. Now going back to Crusoe, he's allocating his. He has, let's say, uh, a bunch of logs. This is a famous example used by Bombaver, the great Austrian economist. Uh, it has a bunch of logs, each of which are homogeneous. In other words, each can be can re as just as good as, each log is just as good as every other log. I think of Bombavarek's example is with horses, which is trickier because some horses might be different, uh, for than other horses, stronger, faster, or whatever. Uh, so, <clears throat> here's, here's, uh, here's Crusoe with a certain number of horses. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, a certain number of logs. He has various uses he can apply them to. He arranges these uses on a value scale, the ordinal value scale, which can be something like this. It can again depend on uh, his, his personal choices and his needs at the time, etc. It can be something like this: so ranking number one, uh, fire to cook cook tonight's food. Uh, number two, ranking number uh, ranking second. Uh, building a, building a fence. Uh, ranking third, keep the wolves out. Ranking third, uh, 
spending a log cabin, ranking fourth, storing the, the log for tomorrow's uh, food, and ranking fifth, a real luxury item, building a boardwalk down to the beach so you don't have to get a feet full of sand. <laughs> okay, so you, so you have, let's say, these five alternative uses for, uh, for his logs. Then the point is <coughs> that the, uh, if he has, let's suppose, if he has five, five logs available, he will then use will then satisfy each one of these five uses. He will then uh, satisfy first, second, third, fourth, and fifth use. If he has only three available, then he's going to allocate them to the first, second, and third rank use and leave the fourth and fifth unsatisfied. Because obviously he's not going to bother building a boardwalk if he can't, you know, he hasn't got the, uh, enough food to eat tonight. That sort of stuff. So, uh, if he loses, if he happens to have, uh, if he happens to have three logs available, and he loses one, one gets washed away by the tide or something, then the, the, the value that he places on this, on this log, the loss of a log, uh, how much it means to him is the ranking of a third. It's the third rank uh, use, because it's, it's the third rank use he's giving up. On the other hand, if he has five logs and he, gives, and he loses one, then he's losing only a fifth ranking use. And uh, still on the other hand, <coughs> If he has only one log and that guy gets washed away and he doesn't eat tonight, he's going to feel very badly and he loses the highest ranking use. So, <clears throat> from this we, we, we conclude the uh, first great law of economics, uh, namely that the uh, more he has of a product, the more anybody has of a product, I should say, the lower... Uh, Lower that will be any unit. The lower uh, any value will be placed on any given unit of that product. In other words, uh, if somebody has a lot of something and loses one of it, uh, he will that will not mean as much to him and not be ranked as high to him as if he has only a little bit and he loses one one of them. This is called the law of diminishing marginal utility. The utility means the same thing as value in, 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 in economics. Again, it's a peculiar use of the term because utility usually is thought as meaning something which is concretely useful, uh, technologically useful. This is not, in, in economics, it, in a, the word utility applies to valuation, really subjective value on the part of the Cuso or anybody else happens to do the valuing. So, uh, in, uh, so we just replace utility by value. Instead of saying ordinal uh, value by utility, instead of saying ordinal value scale, you say ordinal utility scale. Very simple. The marginal refers to the individual unit. You lose one unit or you gain one unit of something. This is, uh, so it refers to concentrating on individual units, either giving up a unit or gaining a unit. So the rule of diminishing marginal utility means if you increase your supply of something, uh, supply meaning n units of whatever product you've got, if you increase your supply of something, uh, the amount that you will value each given unit will be less. If you decrease your supply of something, the amount you will value at any given unit will be uh, greater. Uh, <clears throat> this could be obviously seen with, uh, I'll take for example water. Uh, the amount of utility that you would place on you know, any given glass of water right now is pretty low. I mean, I can, you can, since you can go out to the, to the, to the hall down here and get some, get some water. You're not going to pay much, for example, for a wart, for a glass of water. Uh, most cases in New York you can get, get it free, almost. Uh, on the other hand, if you're trudging now across the Sahara and you've got, you know, your canteen is just about given out and your, and your supply of water is down at almost zero, you're going to pay a heck of a lot for it. Some oasis, you're approaching an oasis. Uh, because in New York City, the, the amount of water is very abundant. The number of glasses of water available are very abundant, and so the, the uh, value placed on any given glass is very low. The other hand, you're out in the Sahara, uh, the, <clears throat> the supply of water is very, is very small, so the amount of uh, value you place on any given glass is extremely high. So that's the law of diminishing marginal utility. One might think this is fairly obvious, uh, but as in all great truths and 
sciences, social or otherwise, uh, there's only obvious answer to some of these thought of it, because centuries were spent in, wor in worrying about problems that were finally solved with the law of dimension margin utility. To be more specific, <coughs> uh, classical economics, which came in in the uh, late 18th century and the early 19th, uh, in the mid-19th century, was hung up on a certain basic problem. They couldn't, they couldn't really analyze consumption very much. <coughs> Uh, because they came up, of course, the full, our basic philosophical problem, so to speak, economics. They said, look, here's bread. We all know bread is very important. It's the staff of life and all that. And yet, bread is very cheap. Uh, the price of bread is very low. On the other hand, here are diamonds, which are, everybody knows they're a luxury and frippery and so forth and so on. Yet, they're very expensive. How do we, here's a, what's known as a, this is, this was known for many years as the value paradox. And they couldn't understand the market can't solve it. They couldn't solve it. They finally said, the classical economists finally said, well, the only way, only thing we can say is that there are two kinds of value, use value and value in exchange. And we have to say that bread is high in use value and low in exchange value, and, and diamonds are low in use value and high in exchange value. It's not a very satisfactory way of handling the problem, the obvious way, the best they could do. And then the, so the classical economists spent very little time on consumption, Zip, zipped over to the business men, and they can analyze it much more readily because they, they can analyze the you know, profit mechanism, that sort of stuff. <clears throat> but this, there was a big hole in classical uh, discussion. It was this, this problem, the value paradox, <clears throat> was finally solved in the early 1870s with the arrival of so-called neoclassical economics, where, as in many other cases in the history of science or invention, uh, the, the, a given problem is solved by several people independently in different countries. Uh, in this case, Karl Menger in Austria, and William Jevons in England, and uh, Leon Vara in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, each one came up independently with different forms, different ways of solving this question, but basically coming up with a similar solution. Uh, namely, well, namely what they said was, on the market, uh, people don't deal in terms of philosophic, of broad philosophic categories. In other words, on the market, in the real world, people are not asked to choose between all the bread in the world and all the diamonds in the world. If somehow the angel Gabriel came down to us and said, you will now be forced to choose forever and ever between all the diamonds in the world, here and forever, and all the bread in the world, we might very well pick all the bread in the world. But the point is, <clears throat> we choose individual, we select or buy or not buy individual units, uh, loaves of bread versus you know, carrots of diamonds. And uh, <clears throat> what hap has happened is that the supply of bread has been so expensive, so abundant, uh, that the value to any given loaf is, uh, is very low. On the other hand, the supply of diamonds is quite, quite small, you know, small, and therefore the uh, price of the value to any given carrot of diamond is very high. In other words, the, uh, you can't deal with, with consumption in, 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 in broad philosophical categories. You have to deal with them in terms of how much is, uh, is this thing valued on the basis of their given supply. If the supply is very abundant, I mean, if, if bread, as I say, if bread had a, a certain, a sudden bread drought or something, if we can only get, so if bread became extremely scarce, uh, we have to buy, you know, a thousand dollars a loaf of bread. Uh, we can easily get to that point sometime. So uh, the point is that the you always have to examine the relationship between the supply of the thing available and the, uh, and the demand for it. So that's the uh, that, that's the way in which the neoclassical economists solve the so-called value paradox. Uh, and as I say, after, after it, you know, it seemed self-evident, but it didn't seem self-evident before the 1870s. It was uh, at least a century or more headache uh, before this, you know, this, this whole question was resolved. And this whole, incidentally, the Austrian and other neoclassical, especially the Austrian method of analyzing economic problems in general, was this, was this sort of method of analyzing individual action. Uh, of, of how does the individual in the real world act? And contrast the class of the classical economists, Smith and Ricardo, etc., who were would tend to think tend to think in broad aggregate categories of uh, who's getting wages, or who's getting profits, and how are these things being allocated, distributed, and so forth. And uh, 
if you start with broad aggregate categories without start building up from, uh, building blocks from the individual, you get completely, uh, thrown askew. The whole analysis gets messed up and you wind up with tremendous in, inbred, in, in, inherent fallacies in the argument. Uh, okay, uh, <clears throat> Macuso, uh, we more or less, most of the categories, uh, well, let's see, we have production, consumption, land, labor, capital goods. Also, another thing about Crusoe is, which is true about us as well, he's in favor of achieving his wants as quickly as possible. In other words, he'd like to get his log cabin built today rather than next week. And the sooner, as far as he's concerned, the better. This concept is a basic concept of human action, which is called time preference. That people are trying to achieve, trying to achieve, if they have any goals at all, which they do, and they try to achieve these goals now rather than later. This is known as a, a contrast of the motto. Or we can say we can revise the old motto and say uh, a bird in the hand is always worth more than a bird in the bush. One bird in the bush. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, the concept of of of, of psychic profit. <clears throat> uh, so is uh, always trying to benefit from any action that he takes, which we we try to do also, at least in the, in the psychic sense. In other words. Uh, if he, if he feels that he'd rather rest for two hours and go and chop up, uh, chop trees, he's doing it because he feels a need for leisure. And so he's then, he's then saying, well, this is my most profitable action for the next two hours in the sense of psychic profit. In other words, uh, psychic gain or high, uh, rising in his value scale. Uh, if you don't, if you don't reap a psychic profit from your actions, then, you, then you'll be reaping, reaping a psychic loss. It's something that, going back to the movie uh, choices uh, again, uh, if you choose, if you say, well, I'm going to spend the next two, three hours in movie A, uh, you're doing it because you think that movie A is a better movie than movie B or movie C, or it's a better way of spending your time in some other way. And if you go to movie A and you like it, then you say, okay, this is great. This is, I, I, I reap the psychic profit from this, from this action. On the other hand, if the movie turns out to be a big bomb, uh, then you say, well, this is a terrible thing. I really, uh, it was a waste of time. Or, uh, this was a psychic loss. In other words, you would rather have gone, if you look at it from hindsight, you'd rather have gone to like movie B. This is, and what you, what then happens is you hope the next time this director you know, makes another movie, you won't go and see it. So that you, you learn from your experience. This is, uh, you know, this is learning on the market. A uh, feedback relationship with the market. So, uh, <clears throat> so the concept of psychic profit is psychic, I'm trying to, everybody's trying to gain a psychic profit, everybody's trying to avoid psychic losses in everything that he does. <clears throat> and another thing about both Cuso and us is the concept of uncertainty. Uh, the world is always uncertain. We never, never can predict the future totally. And, uh, this aspect of trying to anticipate future, trying to predict it, trying to forecast, and hoping you will succeed, trying to determine whether the movie is going to be any good, having a pretty good idea, hoping you'll be right. This is the entrepreneurial aspect of action, in other words, the aspect of uh, meeting uncertainty of the future. Uh, <clears throat> okay, we have Crusoe uh, now, and uh, <clears throat> we pretty well analyzed his, his action. We now bring in Friday. Of the picture. Uh, <clears throat> and either you can have a situation where Cuso is on one island and Friday is on another island, and one of them builds a rowboat to contact the other, or one of them is on one half the island, the other one is the other half, and they contact each other. At any rate, you now have interpersonal contact. <clears throat> and the question is, what are they going to, what's going to happen now? <clears throat> um, basically, and economically, there are two, two, kind, two kinds of relationships that can now be uh, hammered out. So to speak. Uh, one is that either Crusoe or Friday can uh, hit the other guy over the head and steal his accumulated, his vast accumulated hoard <laughs> of, uh, of meat in the log cabin or whatever. Obviously, it's not going to be very much. But he can do that. He can, he can knock him over the head or kill him or something. This is the hegemonic relationship or, or uh, theft. Um, it's not going to be too profitable, at least certainly in this stage, it's not going to be too profitable even for the guy who does it, even for the, for the thief. Because after he's finally consumed the meat and consumed the, uh, uh, 
the fish or whatever, and uh, he's really gotten to the point where he's not too much better off than he was after, you know, before he found the, the second guy. And what he's lost is, fortunately, what he's lost is the is the uh, possibility of of a special division of labor, a specialization uh, relationship. The uh, fortunately, very fortunately for the human race. It turns out that specialization in the division of labor is extremely more productive for all people participating in it. Fantastically more productive than self, you know, any kind of self-sufficient, trying to produce everything in itself. Uh, I mean, just think of, uh, <clears throat> just think of what would happen if we had to produce everything in itself. And a lot of people, strangely enough, and there's no, there's, uh, sometimes I think there's, to paraphrase H.L. Mencken, that there's, Nobody ever went broke under, underestimating the intelligence of American intellectuals. Because uh, there's still a lot of intellectuals out there who not only say we're in a post-scarcity era, um, but also say that we should go back or go on or whatever to a, to a regime of self-sufficiency. Uh, specialization is evil and alienating, a division of, and a division of labor also, and, and therefore everybody should sort of either do everything, which essentially is a Marxian uh, solution, or uh, well, either do everything or somehow rush around. Well, Marx put it, I think, that everybody in the communist utopia of the future, everybody will spend like an hour a day at the factory and then another hour a day at the field, another hour a day of writing and, and rushing around to different, you know, so a real dilettante kind of uh, <laughs> utopia. Uh, and in that way, developing themselves all their facilities in every direction. Now, the thing is that that sort of development in every direction is going to be pretty limited. I mean, nobody's going to, going to be a great mathematician, for example, by doing math for like half hour a day before you're rushing off to the fields. I mean, just that's not, not the way it's done. So, creative development, intellectual development, is going to be out the window. It's pretty clear. Uh, but aside from that, aside from the sociological aspects of it, there's the basic economic aspect that. Um, by smashing the vision of labor, you're really giving up most of the production of the human race. <coughs> uh, <coughs> the uh, even even if it were sociologically or culturally or whatever be beneficial, philosophically beneficial, to abandon the vision of labor, everybody should do everything. Uh, most of us starting this regime would die out very very quickly at the present time, at the current population level. Uh, just think, for example, what would it mean to you know, produce your own hi-fi set, trucks, <laughs> uh, food, clothing, etc., etc. Obviously, well, you have to be reduced down a very, very low primitive level. But even there, we mostly die out because the entire productivity uh, of the modern world rests on the industrial system, rests on the division of labor. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so Crusoe and Friday happily, hopefully, will realize this. And they start exchanging then on a basis, each one starts specializing either in what he can do best or and or what happens to be the closest resource to him. In other words, if, if uh, Crusoe is part of the island, there's a lot of fish, and, he's a, and if he's an experienced fisherman from the old days, he's, he gives up all this uh, ax, uh, log production which he doesn't like anyway and starts specializing in fish. And Friday might be a lumberjack back home, and he starts, you know, he devotes his time to chopping logs. And the two of them then exchange the logs for the fish. Uh, both of them are getting more logs and more fish by far than they could have gotten uh, you know, by trying to be self-sufficient. Now, if this is true for logs and fish, you can imagine how much is true for hi-fi sets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the uh, also. <coughs> Uh, extremely important for the, for the development of the market. And we hear a lot about how the market economy, exchange economy, is uh, the rule of the jungle, where the weak are forced to the wall, stuff like that. Actually, just the other way around, if we really had a situation where resources are very scarce, there's the one water hole, and everybody's zeroing in on the water hole, and there's no exchange going on, then, then it really would be that uh, the weaker force of the wall, that would be it. In other words, in a, in a, in a a situation where the, there's no market possible. Um, that's when the law of the jungle does really apply. But uh, fortunately, not only does everybody participating in the market benefit everybody involved in it, but 
Uh, it turns out that even the schleppiest of us, even the least productive, can participate in the market. The market is, is arranged in such a way that even the we, even even in other words, in, in, we'll take the Crusoe Friday situation. Supposing Crusoe is better than Friday, or Friday is better than Crusoe, at both fishing and uh, and the log cutting. <clears throat> so he's better on both. And one might think, that if, say, Crusoe is better than Friday on both, and there's no possibility for Friday to participate. There's no possibility for a market to be set up because Friday has nothing to do in this situation. It's too, too, too inferior, so to speak. It's not true because it's, it pays for Crusoe. It's supposing he's, he's eight times as good as a log chopper and only five times as good as a fisherman. It pays for him to country on log chopping where he's most best at and allow f and then buy the logs from Friday, where he's least Friday being least bad at the log, uh, log chopping. It pays for him to do that because his, his the level of both uh, incomes go up uh, by doing that. <coughs> so this is known. This was uh, David Ricardo coined this concept. That the law of, this is called the law of comparative advantage. Uh, it was originally applied by Ricardo to international trade, <coughs> and it was only the Austrians later on who by this individual exchange, meaning that uh, even if you're a poor country with very few resources and you haven't got, uh, you're not very wealthy, etc., etc., uh, pays, uh, pays for other people, other nations to trade with you uh, because pays for them to concentrate on what they're most best at and trade with and buy the stuff where you're the least worst at because they're better, they're better off. If, for example, the United States is six times as productive as Morocco in one area and only twice as productive as Morocco in another area, it pays for the United States to concentrate on what it's six times as productive at and buy the stuff from Morocco, even though it's twice as good as Morocco in producing the beans or whatever it happens to be. <coughs> so, uh, this law of comparative advantage uh, means that the, there's room for the schleppiest person or the schleppiest nation on the market, on the free market. In other words, there's, anybody, there's room for anybody to participate uh, it means instead of the, the weakest going under, the weakest have a useful role to play in the whole, in the whole process. So it's really an exhilarating and happy thought, and yet somehow it's not thought of that, uh, among, uh, among the sociologists, intellectuals, etc. Uh, okay, we now come to, uh, oh, and I, I said the, the basis of uh, this the whole market set up um, uh, and the law of comparative advantage and the whole exchange system is uh, the, the, the natural variety of both individuals and resources. In other words, the fact that every person is different from every other person has different abilities, tastes, intelligence, etc., and that every land area is different. Uh, so that one land area has fish and the other land area has uh, grow wheat and so forth and so on. These two things provide the conditions for this Exchange system. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we now come to the more formal uh, embodiment of this. Uh, these truths I've been saying here: more than initial margin utility, etc. Uh, the coming to the f famous demand curve or supply and demand of the the. Uh, basic concept, really, in economics. Uh, it used to be said in the 19th century by critics, harsh critics of economics, used to say that uh, if you, you could teach a power at economics by simply teaching it to say supply and demand, supply and demand. And uh, assess a certain amount of truth to that, because uh, these are the two basic concepts in the field. So at a cocktail party, you can get away, if, if cocktail parties are interested in economics, it's very doubtful. You can get away with a lot by just saying supply and demand at strategic occasions. <laughs> Uh, okay, the, uh, the individual, how much, the demand curve is how much the, in, in, for the individual, is how much any given individual will buy of any product at any given time, uh, at any, at any given range of, of prices. Um, the, the demand curve is based on, uh, uh, derived from the law of diminishing margin utility. In other words, that, you might be willing to pay, I, for example, I'm a chess player of a very, very small ability, I must say. Uh, I might be willing to pay $30 for, the, for my first chess set, but then for buying a second chess set, like for my den or something, 
a spare chest that I would be, might be willing to only pay five dollars and so forth. So that um, again, because of the greater my, my supply of the product I have, the less I'm lower the value I place on it, and so the lower the price, the amount of money I'd be willing to spend for it. Uh, the uh, so from this uh, from this diminishing margin utility, we get the truth that the demand the demand curve or the demand schedule uh, is falling. In other words, as the quantity of the good increases and the price uh, for well, as the quantity of good increases, the uh, uh, excuse me, I should say, as the price falls, the, the quantity will be demanded, the quantity purchased will increase, and vice versa. Uh, so that if, uh, if, for example, I happen to be a, a great chess fan, I might be willing to spend $30 on a chess set, but when you get to the point where it's $100, uh, I'm priced out of the market, so to speak. The other hand, if it gets down to $5, I'd say I can pick, I'll buy a second set. So we get uh, what's known as the falling demand curve. This is figure one. Uh, price is always on the y-axis, uh, for some reason, and quantity is on the x-axis. So in this situation, uh, for the individual, for any given individual, the higher the price, the less he's going to pay, the less he's going to buy of it, and the lower the price, the more he's going to buy of it. You have something like this. You have a, a falling demand curve, D, or DD. Uh, why you might ask is the demand curve a straight line? Well, that's interesting. That's an interesting footnote in history of economic thought. For a long time, they drew the demand curve, the textbook writers, uh, as a rectangular hyperbola. In other words, with the area underneath it always constant. And they did that for many years, and then suddenly, well, I think in the mid 40s, one economist said, Why are they doing this? There's no evidence for it. There's no evidence at all. Why not have a, a straight line? And so since then, the demand curve has always been a straight line. There's no evidence for that either. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to draw it that way. <laughs> one thing you have to realize this is, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of demand and supply curves in a sense, but the one thing that has to always be remembered about them is we never know what they are. So the, big, the big problem in economics texts is that the economics texts say, the demand curve is given here. We given the demand, given the cost, then you crank out the answer. You crank out production, you can't crank out prices. And that's it. And it all seems like a very mechanical thing. It's like you're putting money in a slot and you get the answer out. <laughs> the thing is, in real life, in the real business world, we don't know the demand curve. Nobody knows the demand curve. Nobody knows the cost, really, either. So the whole thing is a very uncertain kind of picture. You, know, you don't start off, hey, is it a given demand curve, can give a cost curve. Because if that's true, you wouldn't have to, you know, all you have to do is to take a course in economics, you can run the whole industry of the whole country very, very simply. So, uh, the problem is, you know, the economist got, began to get enamored of all the curves. And it got, to, it's got to the point now where the, most, uh, people who take economics courses come away from, from thinking that they're sort of third rate math courses. You know, there are a lot of tangencies and, uh, curves on the board and so forth and so on, and not knowing too much about what they mean because uh, the ends, of the, the means have become the ends in, in themselves. Originally, the curves were supposed to illustrate and clarify thought. What happened was the thought began to drop out, and the <laughs> <laughs> curves kept on, took on a life of their own. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we have uh, we have this demand curve. The concept is the at any given time you buy. So, so much of this product, and if price is, is lower, you buy a lot less, uh, buy a lot more. Uh, it's obvious that if, if uh, it's pretty obvious if, if, if for some reason Wheaties became a nickel a box, there'd be a lot more Wheaties purchased. If for some reason Wheaties were up to a thousand dollars a box, very few people, except real Wheaties fanatics, would buy any. <laughs> so it's a fairly simple, again, fairly common sense kind of uh, insight. Uh, all right, this is the individual demand curve. Then what you simply do is you sum up, at least conceptually, it's not simple at all, because you don't even know the individual demand curve. Conceptually, however, if you want to know, if you want to, uh, at least conceptually, how many, how much, how many Wheaties will be bought at a certain, a given price on, uh, in the whole market, not just for one person, but uh, summed up over everybody. Then you sum up all these individual demand curves into one big, uh, market demand curve, which is also falling. <coughs> 
Uh, it's falling for two reasons. One thing is the individual demand curves are falling. So if, if each individual demand curve is falling, then the sum, the sum will also be falling. And secondly, as you keep cutting the price, you tap new people coming on the market at all. In other words, uh, I enter the chess market when it's twenty-five dollars, let's say. Uh, other people enter the chess market when it's ten dollars. So as you keep lowering the price, more people will enter the market altogether. So as you do this. Market uh, the the demand curve keeps getting flatter as you keep and it falls even yeah, more sharply as you keep going. So uh, the individual demand curves are falling and the market demand curves are falling. <coughs> and this really is the end of the individual demand curve for our purposes. Uh, we arrive at least conceptually at the market demand curve. Conceptually, what it says is what the market demand curve says is at any given time. In other words, if we freeze. Right now, you know, at, as of this moment, if we freeze the country, like one of these freeze shots on, on the movies, uh, and if the price then were such and such, if the price of Wheaties were a thousand dollars, how much, how many Wheaties would be bought? If the price were twenty dollars, how much would be bought? Et cetera, et cetera. If the price were a nickel, how much would be bought? And you have your falling demand curve. Uh, obviously you don't know what the shape of the demand, you don't know what the demand curve is. You don't know how much will be bought. All you know is that it's falling. All you know, all we really know is, theoretically, is the more will be purchased when Wheaties are a nickel than when Wheaties, than if Wheaties were a thousand dollars a box. And all the attempts, a lot of attempts, of course, to measure the demand curves, they're all on the nonsense, and I don't want to take up the time in this course to explain why they're nonsense. But the, one of the basic uh, rules of economic theory is that all the laws we have all the truths we have are qualitative rather than quantitative. Uh, as soon as if anybody tells you about quantitative laws, watch out, because <coughs> there aren't any. Uh, <coughs> okay, we have the market demand curve, and then at any given time we have a certain amount of whatever it is available, a certain amount of supply. Supply meaning a number of n number of homogeneous units, whether it's one unit, 20 units, Hundred, two million, or whatever. Now, this, since it's at any given time, since we're freezing the economy at this moment, that means the supply line is always vertical, like so. S being vertical. Now, this, of course, goes against the, those of you who've taken economics courses before. Of course, you all you all know that supply curves are supposed to be forward sloping, but they're really not. They're really vertical because what this what this is saying is. So what you have is you have a bunch of stuff which is there. How it came there we're not talking about yet. That's of course important, but not, not at this moment. We have a bunch of stuff, whether it's Wheaties, hula hoops, copper, uh, spoons, doesn't doesn't matter. We have a bunch of a bunch of units of, of, of things available. And then we have people, the whole market, consumers in the market, evaluating them. And the evaluations will be based on their Value scales, whether it's high on the value scale or low on the value scale. And the demand curve based on these, on these value scales is falling, like so. And the supply line will be vertical because that's what you've got. You've got, regardless of what the price is, you have 100,000 boxes of Wheaties and you can't do much about it, at least for this moment. Obviously, in the long run, you can change the supply. But right now, you're, you have a, so and so many spoons, so and so many Wheaties, so and so many hula hoops, and that's it. So you have your vertical supply line and your falling demand curve. <coughs> uh, <coughs> now what this uh, what this gives you this, this inter inter interaction of these two is that the intersection point between the falling demand curve and the vertical supply line. This, this point here, it's like E equilibrium point, is the so-called day-to-day or market equilibrium price. And the reason it's called equilibrium price is because this is the price at which, toward which the price of this product will tend to, to, to move and at which it will tend to stay. And if it's displaced from it, it will tend to remain there or go back to it. In other words, the intersection of the demand curve and supply curve will, will tend to determine the price of the product. So, if you want to know what the price of Wheaties is, the price of Wheaties will be determined by Man curve for Wheaties, a supply line of Wheaties, and the intersection point will be the. When I say ten, I mean you know day to day. I mean very quickly. Okay, why is that? Why? What? What? What are the forces that uh, that cause this to be the price determining factor? 
the uh, <coughs> okay, let's let's assume for a minute that the the price of the, this product is higher than the equilibrium so-called equilibrium price. The word equilibrium, of course, comes from physics and so forth, meaning the tending to remain in a spot or coming back to it. So that's an attempt again of economics to ape so-called hard sciences. Uh, supposing it's supposing the price is higher than uh, the equilibrium price. The price is higher. This means that the at the, at, at the if this is ten dollars a case, whatever it is, widgets or Wheaties, whatever. And right now it's really about the eighteen dollars a case. At that point, the supply, the amount offered for sale, supply of you know, the widgets or Wheaties, is a lot considerably greater than the, than the amount that consumers will buy. You know, the demand for it, quantity demanded. So what you have is this gap here, a surplus. Uh, People are trying to sell 100,000 Wheaties, uh, boxes of Wheaties, and said, uh, however, but at this high price, consumers can only buy uh, 80,000 boxes. There's 20,000 left over. Something which businessmen and sellers don't like. This is what is known as an unsold surplus. Can't get rid of it. Uh, okay, uh, if, if, how do you get rid of your unsold surplus? Well, you start lowering your price. And as you lower your price, businessmen begin to find, find as if by magic, the surplus begins to disappear. As the price is lowered, more and more quantities are purchased until finally the price is lowered down to the equilibrium point where all the unsold surplus is gone and the market is what is known as cleared. In other words, the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied at that price. Up here, at the price above the equilibrium point, the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded and you have trouble. Have the unsold surplus there. Uh, supposing, on the other hand, that the price is below the equilibrium price, say down here. Well, in this case, like <coughs> Wheaties are you know, twenty-five cents a box, let's say something like that. At that point, well, uh, the five cents a box. Only have it, whatever it was, hundred thousand boxes of Wheaties supplied. But people are trying to trying to buy hundred eighty thousand boxes. Where's the Wheaties? Now what happens is there's a big run on the Wheaties business, and there's a big what develops shortage. Big shortage develops. You can't find it in the stores anymore. Uh, if, for example, the government decreed tomorrow the Wheaties from now on can be sold only two cents a box, you can bet my word, take my word for it, the Wheaties would disappear from the shelves very very quickly. Everybody. Everybody and his brother would rush to get the get this frogging price for Wheaties. Wheaties would be clean out at the end of it because who nobody is right now to be producing Wheaties for two cents a box. Okay, the shortage develops. Uh, this is kind of response to the shortage. The fact that there's more more demanded than supply at that price will start raising the price. And as they raise the price, they find that the gap is eliminated, and when finally get to the equilibrium price. Again, the market is clear. There's neither an unsold surplus nor a shortage. So here, above, and any price above the equilibrium price, uh, supply is greater than demand. Any price below it, demand is greater than supply. And at the equilibrium price, you have the market being cleared where the, there's an exact balance between demand and supply. Uh, that means that the equilibrium price, uh, Whatever, there's enough people to buy, and just enough people to buy whatever is available of a product. And there's just enough at that price available for whatever people want to buy. So the market then has a beautiful built-in mechanism, so to speak, of balancing uh, the amount available with the amount that people uh, want to buy of a product. And uh, <coughs> we will soon see what happens when the when certain forces, uh, largely the government, Try to uh, interfere with this process. You know, this is equilibrating, uh, beautifully equilibrating mechanism. So this is the this is the uh, price determining determining uh, mechanism on the market. No, uh, well, all right. If this is true, and I think it's unexceptionable, then uh, how can a, how can a price ever change? We have the price pretty well set here, fixed by the amount. Supply of a, a vertical supply line and the flowing demand curve. Uh, in that case, what will cause a price to change? Well, obviously, either one of two things or both. 
either the demand changes or the supply changes. And then we, so then if we analyze any price uh, <clears throat> or any price changes in any field, we start looking for these two factors. What happened to the demand for it? What happened to the supply of it? Uh, so, uh, well, <clears throat> the demand can change for various <coughs> reasons. The demand can change, uh, for example, to fashion. <coughs> Me. Uh, the king, let's say, come, or the queen comes out with a, you know, I like, uh, I like a certain brand of martini. Immediately, half the country rushes to buy a certain brand of martini as a, a price. The man skyrockets for that, that uh, brand of whiskey, uh, or vice versa. Uh, Jackie Onassis decrees something or other, a scene wearing some kind of thing, and everybody, you know, starts buying that. Uh, or, my, or the thing drops out of fashion for one reason or another. So, man cha can change for, and th does change for that reason. People, uh, the hula hoop, for example, had a big, big uh, play a few years ago. There was a big increase in the man for hula hoops, and then there was a big collapse after about a year, year and a half of hula hoop mania, and then the frisbee came in after that. So there was a shift from the hula hoop market to the frisbee market. Uh, <clears throat> Man curve for hula hoops went up, and man curve for frisbees, I mean, hula hoops went down, and man curve for frisbees went up. So that's one thing that can change it. Uh, or, the, of course, the supply can change. Why will supply change? Well, supply can change again for various reasons, uh, one of which can be in response to the man, we'll see, see later. But uh, one reason, of course, is this say, is purely technological. I mean, in the agriculture, for example, if, uh, if there's a big drought, the supply goes uh, down. Uh, for example, in this, <coughs> this figure one, if the uh, supposing there's a big wheat drought, you know, or let's say what, yeah, wheat drought is a half the middle of the west is, has too much rain or too little rain or whatever it is, and there's a big uh, big drop in wheat wheat uh, supply coming in this season. In that case, the supply curve shifts to the left. The vertical supply line, which this, this year was X million bushels a week, is now X minus whatever. So this means that the old price, uh, the old equilibrium price, which before this cleared the market, now is, doesn't perform this. Because now it turns out that the old price uh, is now a big, <coughs> a big shortage because not enough wheat now to satisfy the man at that particular price. So the result of that is, because of the shortage, the price quickly goes up, and as it goes up, the shortage is eliminated, and we wind up with this, a new intersection point, or a new equilibrium point, which again clears the market. It clears the market at a higher price, of course, and in order to, again, see to it that uh, there's just enough people to buy uh, the amount of, the, the lower amount of wheat that's available. So we now have a lower quantity for a, a higher price at the new supply line, which say S prime. Uh, so you can see that the, one of the functions that the price system performs is a rationing function. The fact that uh, if the price of everything was free, everybody would uh, grab it unlimitedly, infinitely. Uh, since we don't have an infinite supply of anything, there has to be a price. The more, the more scarce the product, or the more scarce the uh, commodity, the higher the price tends to be. And the more, the, and these people now uh, get priced out of the market. These people who have to drop out of the market because of the higher price, or the marginal, so-called marginal buyers. Uh, and so, as the price goes, as the price goes up, the, uh, the price system performs a, a very important rationing function. The only other way of performing a rationing function would be for the government or somebody to choose who would get the product and who wouldn't, which of course uh, leaves us up with many different kinds of problems, at least. Uh, if, on the other hand, the supply goes up, if it goes from S prime to S, for example, we started up at S prime, and instead of a wheat drought, there's a big increase in wheat production, uh, uh, the climate is very good this season, or there's a much better fertilizer use or whatever, then the supply curve shifts. So from S prime to S shifts from to the right, and it means that the old price is now a surplus, an unsold surplus. People don't want to buy this new increased product at the old price, and so price falls, and we have 
we're back down again to a, a lower price in order to induce people to buy the increased amount. So, we have uh, supply curves or supply lines moving up and down given the demand curves. Given the demand curve, given the, the tastes and wants uh, for a particular product by the public, uh, supply line will move up and down it. In other words, uh, if, as the supply falls, the price goes up, and the supply rises, the price goes down. Uh, in order to, the price will, will go down in order to induce people to, to buy the increased product. <coughs> the uh, here is here we have the of course, one one uh, one point which is always a problem of the economics teachers and students etc. We got across this point. The difference between the when the supply goes up and the quantity demanded increases from here to here, uh, the difference between that and changing the, the whole demand curve, that was the whole demand curve increasing because hula hoops are more fashionable now than uh, supposed to be. Uh, if the whole demand curve increases, that uh, it means that at any given price, more will be purchased than before. And uh, it's a completely different concept, of course, than going up and down the given demand curve. The, uh, now usually in economics, if there's a shorthand, if, if you say there's an increase in demand, what's meant is the whole demand curve shifts up. In other words, at any given price, more will be purchased. Uh, already, I think we're beginning to see something. should be able to see something at this point. Uh, we're not going to get to the money question until much later in this course. But we already should begin to see what can cause all prices to go up. I mean, we're getting we're in a point now, of course, of accelerating inflation. What can cause a situation where almost every price is going up? Some, of course, more than others. Either because the supply, everything is rapidly going down, which is obviously not true. Uh, the supply is, of goods is more or less about what it is now, is increasing you know, each year, it's certainly not going down every year, or because the demand for everything is going up. But if the demand for everything is going up, and we're talking in terms of consumers with a certain given income, uh, consumers can shift their purchases, say, from hula hoops to frisbees, in which case the demand for hula hoops goes down and the demand for frisbees goes up. How can the demand for both hula hoops and frisbees go up? Where are they getting the money from? How can, how can you know, if the consumers are getting a certain income, how can the demand for everything go up? Where's the, where's the magic source from which the money is, is, is flowing? So they can increase all their demand curves. And this, of course, is the $64,000 or $64,000 question. If the, the skip ahead of that is a teaser, uh, the, the demand curves can only go, all go up if somewhere, some, somewhere down in the basement, somebody's printing a lot of money, quotes, uh, and shoveling them out onto the public. So everybody thinks they're better off in spending, happily spending this new money, which then causes prices to go up. Anyway, that's, a, that's, that's of course just a teaser for later. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's uh, our first lecture.